Excellent. Okay, uh, thanks for turning up on this Sunday afternoon and listening to all my, my stuff. Um, and thanks to Adam for going to the trouble to organise things like this, which is quite unusual in my experience. Um, I am here to basically talk about this, which is a book that I, it's just come out. And this is the first time I've ever talked about it. So you're my test guinea pigs for the talk. Uh, so it's the first time I've presented anything on it uh, in this form. So I'd be interested in feedback and stuff later. It only came out like about a month ago. It's, the ink is barely dry, if you can say that. It is online, available in uh, PDF and hard copy form. Uh, I'm going to read from this because I wrote this like on the plane coming home from New Zealand yesterday. So my memory has not captured it all, but I'm going to read it and hope that it embeds in my head and makes sense. All right, what I'd like to do first is ask for a show of hands as to who understands the difference between self-governance and self-regulation. Is there a general idea, consensus about So there's two, two, all right. The most common version of, of the difference would be witnessed in the government making, doing governance and the police enforcing the rules that the government creates. Right, so it's a pretty small proportion. I expect that proportion to be consistent in science. Right. So one of the many aspects of the book is a demonstration that in science there is implicit self-regulation and no self-governance at all in science. To see this better, let's use a sport analogy. Say science was like a game of some kind, say rugby. What constitutes self-regulation in rugby? Firstly, in each player, there is a deeply embedded sense of the rules of the game. Like rugby players, um, scientists learn to play the game entirely and only by playing the game. You are coached by mentors. Secondly, in rugby, there are umpires. These are the people that review the output of the learned behaviour and detect transgression of the rules. In this way, the game of rugby self-regulates. Science is the same. In science, the umpire is peer review. Brilliant self-regulation. But what of self-governance? In rugby, unlike science, the rules of the game are actually written down. In rugby, unlike science, there is a body of governance that is responsible for the care and review of the rules of rugby. This is because sometimes rules change. When the rules of the game become ambiguous or there is a need to account for some change in circumstances, rugby turns to its self-governance mechanisms. This is a process totally unlike the role of the umpire in the peer review process. Look what happened in the recent era. There are now two kinds of rugby, union and league. The difference between them is managed by rugby governance. That is the difference between self-governance and self-regulation. Self-governance determines the rules of the behaviour and self-regulation ensures that the behaviour is enacted according to the rules. So look at what this means in rugby. Lots of players, lots of games, self-regulation, but in rugby there's more. To learn rugby you can play the game, but you can also consult a book of rules. The governing body for rugby wrote them down. All rugby players know there is an explicit book of rules and that there is a governing body that is responsible for their regular review and dissemination. That's rugby. Explicit rules, governing body, self-governance, regulation in player training by umpires. But what of science? Brilliantly self-regulated, but where's the governing body? Where are the written rules? There are none, at least there's none that I can find in 10 years of searching. On day one of a scientist's training, if there were written rules, then the first thing that would happen um, in, is that the PhD mentor would hand them over to the novice and say, here's what we do, read them, learn them. But that does not happen. I've just done this, I know this, I'm empirical evidence of this. 
very thing. In science, it does not happen. There are no written rules. There is no governing body that acts in review of them. In science, what is, what is the impact of the lack of self-governance? Does it really matter? We may all think that we know scientific behaviour when we see it. We may all think we recognise the output of scientific behaviour when we see it. But just recognising scientific behaviour or science output in the way that we might recognise a leaf or a chair is not enough. Back to the rugby analogy. Consider a rugby league player that has never seen any written rugby rules ever and yet knows brilliantly how to play the game and recognises a rugby player when uh, seen in action. That player defers to the umpire of self-regulation. That rugby league player might deny the need for self-governance or even know what self-governance is. And rugby might soldier on quite oblivious to the lack of self-governance. To deny the need for self-governance is to assume that we know everything about r what rugby is and confusing that with what rugby can be. A rugby league player might encounter rugby union and decide that it was not rugby, when all along rugby union is possible, just not obvious because of the lack of self-governance made the possibility invisible. This very situation is what the book claims and proves is going on in science. Millions of scientists, I think, if you go onto the web, you can get estimates like 50 to 75 million scientists and engineers in the world at the moment, roughly. No written rules, no self-governance, brilliant self-regulation. All scientists claim they know what science is and are extremely well trained in recognising what it is. It's our job to know that. It's what peer review is, involves. We prove it in the brilliant uniformity of a system that self-regulates and assumed behaviour. And all along, all we science, scientists actually know is what we do, not what is possible. We all think we know what science can be when we all, all we know is what science actually does. In a world of zero self-governance, what science actually does and what science can be can part company in a way that is completely invisible to us all. Indeed, someone might pop up with a novel way of doing science. And this happened recently. Hey, guys. Why don't we do science like this, says Stephen Wolfram, right? And all scientists would say is, that's not how you do science, and they'd be right. Not because the new proposal is invalid, but because nobody is in charge of governing science, and because of that, no one is actually authorised to decide one way or the other. Everybody knows what science is, not what it can be. So the new proposal by Stephen Wolfram is not wrong, it's just unrecognised, and as a result, there is no formal self-governance in any new proposal, has no formal ear to listen to it. Now, if there was a body responsible for science self-governance, what would it look like? Philosophy does not have that responsibility. Sorry about that. Science has it. Scientists leaving all self-governance, science self-governance to a third party of any kind would be like rugby handing over responsibility for rugby governance to say the International Toad Sex Federation. It just doesn't make any sense at all. Self-governance is self-governance done by those within and on behalf of us all. Nobody is qualified to govern science except scientists or someone they appoint for the purpose. A self-governing science that actually worked would have some kind of forum available to all science scientists to get proposals for deciding on behalf of us all what unique and valid scientific behaviours constitute the ambit of working scientists. No such bod science body exists. This forum here today is not such a body. So here we are with an important human behaviour, perhaps the most important human behaviour there is, and there is no self-governance. I turn up in science with a need to formally examine and change scientific behaviour, and what do I do with it? 
How am I to enact change or the possibility of it? I can be heard by nothing but scientists that think they already know what science is and can safely ignore any such proposition. Which is exactly what happened to Stephen Wolfram. There is no body that can review his proposition. The cycle is stuck like this, and it's been stuck like this for centuries. Ending this cycle of self-reinforcing non-self-governance is what the book is about. This is an act of science governance by an individual, me, the tiny tail wagging the massive dog. And it, the book does this in two stages. The first half of the book does for science what the governance of rugby did. It measures and writes down the rule that is implicitly operating in all scientists. I spend eight chapters doing that in the book. The result is that in chapter eight, for the first time, you find a law of nature called the law of scientific behavior. The behavior was measured and documented. I didn't just make it up. I looked at what scientists do and I wrote it down. In a scientific study of scientific behavior, like everywhere else in science, you cannot ask scientists what they think science is. You must observe objectively what we do. That is what I did. So the book delivers a scientific outcome, an empirical outcome, a formalized natural regularity as usual. Once you have it written down, then you can look at some governments. <clears throat> you can look at what rules produce. What might be missed by that rule of scientific behavior? Let's look at the law of scientific behavior. Come on. Right. To get your head around a natural law about the creation of natural laws, you need it takes steps three, which are mysteriously labeled steps one, two, and two. Uh, forgive me for that. First thing you do is you say, what does the law of nature look like? And you say, well, the generic form of all laws of nature, it has a form. And I tried to assemble that form. And that's the first one here. I'm not pointing with anything. Uh, you write them all down. Quantum mechanics, Newton, the Newtonian dynamics, chemistry, anything could be written in this form. A form called TM, it's just a name, a label for the law. And then it says the natural world in some context behaves like this. It's pretty simple. You say that all laws can be recouched in those terms. And then once they're accepted as a law of nature, and they're all distributed in all manner of forms all over the literature, you can collectively put them together into a big set like that. With all these members in the set, except the number TN is just the end member of a huge set of what we all currently agree are laws of nature. There's also a complementary set to set T, and they're the ones that didn't make the grade. Set H. Now, ones that haven't made the grade are, in fact, ones that could make the grade, like hypotheses, but yet haven't yet because they haven't been empirically proven. They get empirically proved and they move to there. If someone disproves one, then it moves from there to there. Astrology and phrenology and faith healing and stuff like that are all living happily in set H and will never be used to predict anything about the natural world, except people trying to believe in them. So, um, notice that the book is actually an example of exactly this process. Right? I observed a natural regularity, abstracted it, and wrote it down. It's just that the one that I wrote down is actually the one we're all operating by and it's self-referentially complete. It's, uh, it's, it makes a great deal of sense that that be the case for any such law. So now, this thing called, the thing that I'm targeting here, the law of scientific behavior, is actually in set T, like all the others, called TA. Why it's called TA, I'll tell you in a minute. It's a law of nature about the creation of laws of nature the behavior of people. Now we have written down what we do, how, how are we to know what is possible? Now, TA, 
which I haven't shown you yet, yet, the form that I measured and wrote down as best I could. I'm not saying it's right or the final form or anything. I'm just saying I've done it. This is what it looks like. So within set T, we've got TA in the, natural, in, the, in the form of TN, the natural world in the context of a human being scientific about the natural world behaves as follows. To create and manage the members of a set of statements of type TN, each of which is a statement predictive of a natural regularity in a specific context in the natural world external to and independent of the scientists derived that through the process of critical argument and that in principle can be refuted through the process of experiencing evidence of the regularity. Now I did this by measurement. I didn't in invent it. I looked at all the behaviours, wrote them all down, averaged them, and this is the average that I got. And I'm not saying it's right or final, but it's a place to start for a body of governance to use to actually come up with the working real version. I had to start somewhere. So that's where I am in chapter eight. So to figure out what is possible from what we do, one thing you can do, which is what I did, is look for special circumstances where what we do fails to contact the natural world in the usual way. So, what I find here is that for only the last 20 years, there is most definitely something breaking down in science that does not get contacted by this law. What is fundamentally impossible for the law of scientific behaviour, TA, is the science of scientists. That is, the science of scientific behaviour itself. The science of the scientific observer, which is the science of consciousness. Scientific observation and consciousness are identities. They're literally the same thing. Scientific observation is not scientific measurement. I'm going to discuss now uh, one of the diagrams in the book which depicts the dynamics of set T and set H and an observing scientist in a way that makes the difference between observation and measurement clear. Here's your scientist who is making, who is operating an instrument that is doing scientific measurement. What's happening is that either an existing set T member is being tested again or somebody's decided that there's a hypothesis out there that needs some checking that <coughs> maybe a law of nature, and it's been a measurement is being applied, and then that measurement is being observed. So scientific measurement happens here, and scientific observation happens in the mind of the observing scientist. Now it may, it may be confirmed and end up in set T, or it may be disconfirmed or ambiguous, in which case it goes back to set H and sits there. It's the general dynamics of the mechanism that I propose in the book in chapter 8. So, <clears throat> scientific measurement can be done by the scientist. In other words, if the science, if the observation and the measurement are the same thing, for example, count the ele elephants, right? How many elephants are there in this room? Well, there's one really big smelly one over there about science, but so one, <laughs> okay, in this particular case. Uh, scientific, you can also couch this process in terms of causality, which I also do in the book. This is a, another figure from the book. So what happens in science in the sense of causality is that you have some natural phenomenon which is happening out there in the world and it's interacting with instruments which then produce results and the scientists then observe the results. That's where the connection with the consciousness of the scientist and the rest of the natural world actually occurs in here. As a result of uh, mental processes of undefined nature that I uh, go to some considerable length in later chapters working out, a law of nature gets deposited in set T, Kachini. So this is billiard ball causality actually running science, scientific behaviour. This, this is like cause and effect. So if, if this result is the evidence of some natural process, then what's this? 
depicting the result of it. It's another natural process. Set T itself is scientific evidence of scientists. If there was no set T, if, if all humans disappeared from the earth and aliens turned up and looked for uh, signs of life, signs of science, they could conclude there were scientists by virtue of that and their cognitive capacities would have to go along with that. So that's, that's the general thread of, of the um, science process captured in chapter 8. Scientific observation is when an individual scientist encounters the evidence, whatever its form, using consciousness. And science, as it, is, as it is currently carried out by all, presupposes the existence of a scientist and the consciousness that is scientific observation. Laws of nature, TN, merely predict how the natural world will appear to that presupposed observer, the human scientist. This means that the scientific observer cannot be explained in principle by the behaviour captured by TA. TA is operating inside this person, being trained to operate in that way. That behaviour cannot capture the fundamental mechanism that allows scientific observation to occur because it's presupposed. You can't explain observation, scientific observation with scientific observation. It doesn't make any sense. It's like saying runners run by running. Right? The logic is gone. Um, this means, sorry, that is the way science is conducted in its undocumented and unself-governed -govern form is intrinsically going to find a real understanding of consciousness impossible. That impossibility is not in place because the science of consciousness is actually impossible the impossibility is in place because science has configured itself to be confined to a behaviour that will find it impossible in practice and it never reviews itself, thereby making sure that the science of consciousness is locked in a state of perpetual procedural impossibility. How? Well, look at TA, which we've got here. <coughs> In presupposing the observer can experience evidence. <clears throat> um, where are we? Sorry. The impossibility that the book characterises in detail is not a failure of science in the normal sense. It is a procedural failure as follows. For the first time in the history of science, once the science is done, unlike anywhere else in science, the science, scientist will not be able to hand over to engineers the formulaic basis for the natural world that is normally handed over. Normally, science, scientists hand over the outward appearances of the discovered natural world in a principled way that allows engineers to successfully build an artificial version of the natural original. The conditions for fire, for example. You, you, the scientist says to the engineer, you need oxygen, it looks like this, you need fuel, it looks like that, and you need some kind of ignition, it looks like that, and then there shall be fire. All of those things can be brought into being by an engineer, and artificial fire can be a reality as a result. Right? Normally, scientists hand over the outward appearances of the discovered natural world. I already said that, sorry, delete that. Not so for the science of consciousness. You cannot deliver a first-person private experience objectively to the world. This is how the pr procedure, TA, fails. This is the nature of the limits of access to the natural world delivered by TA. It cannot account for an ability to observe. That is the first-person perspective of the scientist. It doesn't even predict one. It's presupposed. None of the laws of nature, anything describing atoms, all of it, none of it predicts the first person perspective of any scientist. So here we sit with a bit of a problem. Scientific behaviour is, for the first time in science history, formally operating at a unique boundary condition, the science of scientific observation, where the normal assumed scientific behaviour, TA, makes the result impossible in principle. In the science of consciousness, we are, as usual, challenged by a mystery in the natural world, but this time the mystery is ourselves, scientists. 
To discover our way out of this problem is to discover ourselves, the fully expressed natural world of the behaving scientist. And it cannot be only TA. It must have some other behaviour, a new behaviour, and I already put that behaviour in set T. Right there. There's a second behaviour called TS, which I haven't described at all. So what I'm saying is that to do science is not to just do TA. There is in fact another behaviour you can do that is equally and equivalently expressive of natural world regularity as TA is. It's just different and it has one extra ambit. That is, it can explain consciousness. So set T itself now contains everything scientists can do when behaving scientifically. TA and TS. We're all familiar with TA. The book adds the new behaviour, TS. Scientific outcomes of this mature science with a new option not previously formally recognised will, in a way not yet revealed, give us a real understanding of consciousness, the science of the scientific observer, in a manner that allows engineers to build artificial consciousness and then prove it because we know what the natural world is actually doing to deliver it. That science, done according to TS, does not exist. And if we limit ourselves to what we've always done, we will never succeed in the way that we succeed everywhere else in science. This failure is a failure to explain us, scientists. So what is this new kind of scientific behaviour? TS. In practice, it is exactly what Stephen Wolfram says it is. Surprise, surprise. Cellular automata but not CA of the kind in his book. A special form is needed and a special interpretation is also needed. I spent the whole of chapter 11 detailing the specifics of that um, technique. So how do you amend science that it, so that it can operate to explain the scientific observer? To do that is to describe the natural world in a way that uh, as it exists, prior to the existence of the scientific observer. That is, the normal presupposition of the observer has to cease. So the scientist is actually gone. This is not science done by humans. The change to science is that scientists must cease to be the originators of the descriptions of the natural world. In 1850, this paradoxical state of affairs might have been a showstopper. But 60 or 70 years ago, something unique happened in science. Computers arose. For the first time in history, a new way of characterising the natural world arose and took its place beside humans where it has remained hidden in plain sight all along. The new kind of science that solves the problem of consciousness and thereby explains scientists is not done by humans. It is done by computers initialised by scientists, by humans. That's the behaviour in TS. You initialise a cellular automaton, you run it to a certain point, stop it, interpret it, look at all the results, stick that in a published um, vehicle, and that's the other kind of science. It's not like normal science. In chapters 9, 10 and 11, all I do is represent what Stephen Wolfram did with the exception that I simply qualified the content of the cellular automaton computation and gave its principal scientific role. The cellular automaton is describing what the natural world is actually made of, not what it appears to be made of to an observer made of it. The S in TS means structure. This new kind of science in chapter 12 is named dual aspect science. That contrasts with what we do at the moment, single aspect science. Dual aspect science is what, sorry, single aspect science is what we do now. Dual aspect science has two different kinds of scientific behaviour in it. If the way we do science at the moment uh, is called the appearance aspect, and that's why I've got TA there. And the new one, CA approach, is called the structure aspect. There's one natural world and two radically different descriptions of it. One done by humans and one done by computers. They're tied at the hip 
in an explanation of the scientific observer, the scientists. They must be consistent with each other at all levels, or one of them, one of the descriptions is wrong. And the output, the output of uh, the science doesn't go into set T and set H. There's another set in the book I called T dash and H dash for the second aspect. A completely new set of uh, science deliverables. The validation of the structure aspect is that it shall first and foremost reveal the mechanism for consciousness observable by humans in a computational output that is responsible for what delivers an ability for humans to do scientific observation. That is the empirical challenge here. This is an empirically established science framework, not just a policy change on paper. Dual aspect science is validated by using existing appearance aspect science in a special way described in chapter 12. It's simple enough. We initialize <coughs> and run a large CA simulation of explored structural primitives of some kind, and then by the very mechanisms within the cellular automaton, we deliver a, a natural world that appears to be made of space and atoms and fields and all the other things that the normal appearance aspect science you, comes up with when they inspect the nat when we inspect the natural world. Only then does the chosen structural primitive explored by the CA get sanctioned as valid science. Like I said, this is an empirical proposition. The minute it does that, then it earns the right to deliver a second view of the natural world delivered by computer and interpreted by humans. The addition of this second structure aspect kind of science done by computer is the main contribution of the book. So, in summary, what the book delivers is the first real act of science self-governance in which scientific behaviour itself is upgraded. Before the upgrade, there was only one kind of scientific behaviour, the appearance aspect we are all familiar with. None of those laws are changed. Those laws that predict, the ones that predict what the natural world looks like to a presupposed observer. After the upgrade to dual aspect science, we have a new kind of scientific behaviour, the science of the structure aspect. A scientific behaviour that uses computers to account for not what the natural world looks like, but what it is actually made of, including what scientists are made of, so that they might be scientists at all. One natural world, two ways of describing it, one done by humans, the second done by computer. Okay, now we're at chapter 12, mercifully close to the end. Chapter 12 is a test for consciousness. Once you introduce the concept of sci the scientific observer in the context of a full dual aspect science framework, a test for consciousness becomes obvious. To be, con to be conscious is proved by an ability to be a scientist. If you look here, right, I, we talked about this just a minute ago. What's the proof that scientists exist with certain cognitive faculties? These things. So if you make an artificial scientist, which is the main objective of the book overall, you can, you can use that to actually prove what consciousness is, where it comes from. But if you build an artificial version of it, and if it can do science based on consciousness used as scientific observation, then you've proven it's consciousness. It's conscious. And in scientists, it's easy to prove. Take away the consciousness of a scientist, and that being will be forever empty. There will be no laws of nature. And you can degrade it as a continual degrade. If you have so many gin and tonics, the scientific behaviour degrades seamlessly to nothing. Eventually you pass out and then science is gone completely. No. Uh, so what you do uh, to prove that an artefact is conscious is to get it to do science on the radically novel and unknown natural world. And the artefact does not have to win a Nobel Prize. All the artefact has to demonstrate is an ability to first be ignorant of something, then do simple science on something radically novel. In fact, in the test, neither the testers nor the test subject can ever be, have been exposed to it. And then the artefact has to come up with a natural regularity that is then proved by its application in another completely different context. 
I can't deal at detail at all now, but the test and an example of the test are all in chapter 12. In reality, it kind of looks a bit like um, an intelligence test, but it's more than that. Chapter 13 of 14 uh, is actually an interpretation of the content of the book in the context of scientific revolution process Thomas Kuhn came up with in 1962. I've brought his book along. If you want to get the most out of my book, I highly recommend that you read Thomas Kuhn's book, especially the edition that came out in 2012, the 50th anniversary. This is a great book. The guy was a physicist and became a philosopher. And by every measure of what a scientific revolution is, we, are, we have them all right now existing in science. We're in the cusp of, of, a, of a revolution and we don't actually know it because the two necessary people, physicists and neuroscientists, are in different silos, not talking to each other. If you put a foot in each basket, you can see all the signals are there. The revolution is, I'm not claiming it's going to happen, it's already happening. Right. Um, so that's the Thomas Kuhn thing. Really, it's worth spending the 20 bucks to live on the book. There's a lot of references in my book to Thomas Kuhn all the way through. The final chapter looks at the implications for artificial intelligence and machine consciousness. It's chapter 14. In this final chapter, I deliver a paradoxical explanation for the 60 year old failure of artificial general intelligence. AGI. We fail to deliver the truly generally intelligent machine with human level capacities, including, including basic common sense. Having just spent all this time telling you that computers have a unique central role in science, in the dual aspect science framework, it turns out that the framework easily predicts the failure of AGI. This is because we've been using computers. This sounds weird, right? That is, we've been tackling AGI wrong from day one. Instead of computing models of the brain in inorganic form, what the book explains is that to do real AGI, all you have to do is exactly what we have done everywhere else in science. That is, put the physics of the brain in inorganic form in the hardware. And that is not putting a computer together. Two different things. We're also used to thinking that to do AI is to use computers. Why we think this way is not in the scope of my book. A whole book could be written on just that history to explore the very strange, unique state that science is in in that regard. Computers are obviously a way to some kind of intelligence, but it is not the route to AGI. It never was. I can illustrate this by another figure, which I took from the book in chapter 14. Right, so what we've got here is classic science of the single aspect, appearance aspect, in two forms. On the left, we have traditional science, empirical science. For 300 years, that's what we did. To get a handle on the natural world, we literally used the natural world. When computers turned up and we could compute the model of the natural world that we came up with, we suddenly had another form of science, but it's not, it's still appearance aspect science. It's the, it, it, experimental theoretical science. That is, you look at the natural world, in this case fire, you can understand it by actually burning stuff artificially, artificial fire, or with the abstractions of fire, the physics of fire, you can compute a model of fire and explore fire. This is not burning. This is burning. The two equivalent kinds of science, and only this one is available in the last 50 years. And you can go through the whole of science and you can look at exactly this process. All through it, uh, from the very early days, I mean, this is like when did, when did this the fire, artificial fire, was made like 200,000 years ago, a million years ago, I don't know. 
artificial flights a bit more recent, right? We have made artificial flight. When we did that, we actually flew to understand flight. We didn't compute, we didn't come up with a theory of it and then all of a sudden learn how to fly. We actually flew and then we came up with the abstraction of the flight. And notice that we're not replicating a bird. We're replicating the flight. And it doesn't look like a bird, but it's still flying. This flying, this is flying, and the computed abstractions of the physics of flight is not flying. It's sitting on your bench top and it's called a flight simulator. Not flying. And you can go through a progression, which I did, towards uh, human organs, starting with the stomach. This is an artificial stomach. You can see it in a Hobart in Mona, the museum of something or other. Crazy Belgian guy who's built huge machines that produce shit. I mean, you know, but it's, it's artificial digestion. Right? Here's a natural digestive thing, a human stomach. And here's a computed model of stomach chemistry. It's not digesting anything, it doesn't produce shit. Excuse my language. And here is a heart, a natural phenomenon. It's a pump. Here's an artificial pump used as a heart. Literally, you can buy one of these in England, it's an English company. Over here, you've got a computation of heart physics. It's not pumping anything, but it's very, all of this is very, very useful in understanding these things and in building artificial versions of these things. These are complementary behaviors, very powerful. If you want to learn how to fly, flight simulators are brilliant. If you want to design an aeroplane, Flight simulator is brilliant. Let's talk about SpaceX self-destructed last night, was it? Yeah. Right? That's an expensive way to explore the natural world. Right? And finally, you get into a mental explosion with the brain. For 50 years or more, this is all we've been doing. This is actually empty. There's nothing there. It's an empty hole. Now, this is an artificial version of this. It's got brain physics going on in here. This has got the physics of a computed model of this. And you have to explore your own mental attitude as to why you think that and that are identical. And when you do that, you discover that you've made a really big mistake because for the entire period since computers were, were uh, discovered and created and the physics of the brain has been explored since the 1950s, we've been computing models of it and thinking that it's that. And in fact, it's inconsistent with every other aspect in science. Inconsistent. There is no formal proof that that and that are the same. Anywhere in science, it's a presupposition that has existed for the entire modern era. And that leads to, that's the end of my book. I just leave it there. Um, I can give you one last final hint about the work that I'm doing, and I think I left a slide in there. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, I did put a slide in here. The one on the right is this. This is what we've been doing for 50 years. It could be computed or it could be actually build equivalent circuit models of brain physics, put them on a chip, call it a neuromorphic chip. You're still doing computing. It's just in hardware. This is a model of the actual natural brain. And this is membrane physics, electromagnetism. On the left hand side, what I'm trying to do is actually build the physics on the chip. And that is the chip. It does, it's a physical, inorganic version of the membrane physics, literally. Right? It doesn't compute a number which says what the action potential is doing. It actually produces the action potential, the fields that are actually being produced by the brain that come out of your skull, literally. And it has the same voltages in it, but the voltages are produced by tissue physics, not by a model of the tissue physics. So
So this is on the left side of the previous diagram, and this is on the right side. And I'm doing that, and I think, as a result of an accident from luggage, I might still have a physical device in my bag. You might see if I can dig that out for you later. It's a little round disc thingy. All right, I think I'll stop annoying you and end it. Thank you very much for listening. Well, what I did, and I explained this in the book, is that I didn't do it as a formal study of, 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 a, co of a cohort of scientists. What I, I've got 40 years' experience in scientists. I've met hundreds of thousands. I've seen them work. Um, I've been trained in it myself. I've looked around. I've, if you go to 501 in the jury system, there's a truckload of books, and every attempt at describing science behaviour is in there. And I've read a lot of those books just to see yeah, how it contrasts. Uh, I mean, you said that it was a scientific study. Yeah, hundreds. Okay, hundreds, study. thousands. Yeah. If someone wanted to do it formally as a specific study, they're welcome to it. But I. Well, there's 40 years of um, uh, sociological study of um, scientists and their practices. There's um, uh -huh. considerable, I mean, I've spent the last 30 years reading this stuff. Yep. Uh, are you aware of this? this of course thing? I have. I've read it all. But it doesn't touch what I just described to you. None of it. I've looked. It's not describing scientific it method. Like it sounds very it's a measurement. I mean, I, I can actually show you. If you look, there's a list of about. Um, I don't know, it's somewhere about 100 different aspects of scientific behaviour right. that constitute noise mm -hmm. in a measurement. Data points in there, measure measurements. Measurements. The measurements that I've made are my experience of scientists in the real world. Okay, well, if what, what I say in this book is that I haven't done a formal study of that kind. But I'm, what I also state is that if someone wants to replicate everything according to what this book is describing, they're welcome to do it and it would come up with basically the same result that I have. And it's not in any book at the moment. That I know for sure, because I've tried to find it and I can't. Yep, okay. Can you stand so I can see you in the camera? Oh, thanks, uh, Colin. You've raised a million questions in philosophy of science and you've raised another million questions in neuroscience. Yeah. I, unfortunately, I can't ask them all today. But on the neuroscience, I mean, both of them are absolutely fascinating, I think. Uh, uh, but on the neuroscience aspect, just on the last bit, where you're mimicking the physiology of the brain in a computer chip, um, it's, it seems you're mimicking the, the way the electrical potentials and the currents are going. I'm, I'm curious to see what you're doing about, I don't know what they're called, but the chemical the chemical things that are floating around that, that moderate the neurotransmitters. Yeah. Um, the, what are you doing about the neurotransmitters? The basic device is surrounded by some regulatory ele standard electronics, which measures voltages and adapts in um, predefined ways to the conditions. And that's how it can change its behaviour over time. So there's a chip with this physics going on in it, and also within the chip is a, is a whole lot of standard electronics that is actually measuring the properties of the physics and adapting it. It's actually a, it, there is, you said computer chip, it's not a computer chip at all, right? There is physics going on in there, and it's self-regulating control loops, in effect. Oh, so that's what you mean it's by... It's an adaptive control loop. That's what you mean by the, the new way of mimicking the brain, way beyond the it's not digital, it's not ones and zeros. No, no it's all analog. Oh, then there may be, it's possible to convert it to digital within the digital part. You can A to D and do some actual classical computation, like you do in signal processing in, uh, in engineering, but it's not actually 
the classically programmed approach, or classical, a programmed approach examining some abstraction of the brain, it's actually um, literally expressing the physics that's in the brain. So, and then, yeah. <coughs> uh, I was just wondering about the difference between scientific observation and consciousness. You were, you were equating the two, saying yeah. consciousness is observation. Okay. And I've observe, had you can be conscious, but actually not come up with theories. So, is it right to equate those two? No, the same you have. Yeah. yeah, you're quite right. The behaviour, not only do you have to have a normal functioning cognitive human, that human has to behave according to TA, that behaviour, uh, and then that becomes science driven by consciousness as scientific observation. But not all consciousness is obvious. Every part of consciousness, is, I'm being flooded with it at the moment, right? That is not me being a scientist because I'm not doing TA. However, um, when I'm doing science, some well-defined subset of my entire consciousness is applied to the act, and without it, I can't do science. What about induction? No, I mean, can you get a machine to do induction or deduction? That the the machines that I, that machine that I just said, yes. They're non, what would you say, non, uh, non monotonic reasoning, I think is the general term for that, um, which includes induction, is possible by simple uh, th these fields that resonate with each other, one impacts the other. Whatever that means in terms of the overall cognition of the artefact, it can include illogical um, outcomes, which would be the kind of mistakes we make all the time. So I'm making a machine that can be wrong about something. I can make a, I'm making a machine that can be as confused about things. In fact, the machine that is conscious is the only machine that can be confused about consciousness. Right? If, I, if we get a machine that is, can be confused about consciousness, you've actually proven that it's conscious. <laughs> they, that's one of the sort of downstream consequences of all this thinking. Uh, it's not about being right, it's about being predictive. Those two things are different. Um, I've listened to your talk, very, very interesting, but it seems to me people like Roger Penrose, who you never mentioned, I would have expected. Well, there are many people to mention. Yes, yeah, I've met him. Because he had, yeah. um, he had uh, what was it, The Emperor's New Mind, and then yeah. uh, several other books, arguing the pitch and toss about what he said in The Emperor's New Mind. Mm -hmm. And I, I was just wondering about his ideas, no, I, could, I had to stop somewhere. Uh, yeah, there's a whole part of the talk that could be done on the quantum approaches to consciousness. And the, the immediate connection that I can make is to say that Roger Penrose is actually right. You can't compute consciousness. However, you can make artificial consciousness. And the quantum mechanics upon which it is made, based, is actually comes along for the ride in here. This is all quantum mechanics. The electromagnetic field system is fundamentally all quantum mechanics, down deep. The photon exchanges that constitute the application of force between particles, all of that stuff is just quantum. So you've got a, a, a massive field system in space which forms a, a wave mechanics that has quantum properties. But it's all ultimately based on subatomic level quantum processes. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, Rod, Roger Penrose is dead right. At least I, I think that's the way it will turn out. Uh, I think yes, that's what will be proved in the end. You know, from Roger Penrose, you've got the idea of fuzzy logic where um, you've got a, a quantum mechanical like um, paradigm between the input and the output. There's a, an 80% uh, chance that the one given thing, stimulus, the other yeah. one will yeah. happen, but then again, you could jump the other way. The way, that's right. And in that way, the hypersensitive dependence on very, very tiny quantum mechanical effects could be built into this system and determine the output, which could be the non-monotonic reasoning we just talked about. You know, you choose the wrong one 20% of the time and the other 80% you might get it right or vice versa. Mm -hmm. It could all depend on 
absolutely microscopic quantum processes that just push something over the tipping point. Yeah. And, and in that way, it can be as wrong or as right as we are. Yeah. So I was just that went through my mind. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have Bill Hall. Uh, we're running a bit late.